morning. morning. And welcome to Christ Central Presbyterian Church where we have all gathered together to worship the triune God in spirit and in truth. It is uh, very good to be with you. Uh, Just a few announcements before you begin our time of worship. Uh, I would uh, refer you to the announcement page in the back of your bulletin. A couple things here. First, we have uh, ladies, a baby shower. That's always fun. I've heard the grapevine. April 13th. Uh, from 10 to noon for Megan Burns. And so RSVP to Loretta. Uh, You have uh, the email there and everything, so keep that in mind and mark that on your calendars, ladies. Men will be turned away at the door. Um, Yes, I'll be the bouncer, so be nervous. (laughs) Be be scared. Uh, (laughs) uh, Congregational meeting, Sunday, April 21st. Uh, Keep that in mind as well. And also... Uh, men's theology study. Um, let me know if you have any interest in this. It would be once a month on a Sunday afternoon. It would be a Sunday that we don't have the college group. It would be a Sunday uh, that we don't have prayer meeting. Um, and so it would be a different Sunday each month uh, depending on, on those things. But uh, let me know. You can text me or call me uh, or uh, email me if you have interest in, in doing such a thing. Um, all right. And also that we have our connection card, especially if you are guests with us here at I ask you to fill that out and put that in the offering plate as it is passed. Uh, Now as we begin our time of worship, let's stand together for a call to worship from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Amen. Let's grab our hymnals together and sing hymn 76. Let's sing. Yes, Father, you are the God 
of grace, who we ask you to be gracious to us, O Lord. Be gracious to us, for our souls take refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings we will take refuge until destruction passes by. We will cry to our Lord, the Most High, who accomplishes all things on our behalf and has accomplished the greatest thing in our Lord Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And now we know and believe that he is seated at your right hand, awaiting for the time where he returns to make all things new. And we await that time as well, Father. And so we are gathered here worshiping in his name, seeking your face, asking you to be here in our midst. Lord, we pray knowing that our worship is in vain uh, without you, that you would be in our midst working. Uh, do as you delight. Uh, help our souls to submit to thy will. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. As your word goes forth in song and in prayers and is seen in the Lord's Supper and is preached, we ask you to do what you have said and nourish your people. We open our mouths. Will you, feel, uh, will you fill them? We believe you will. And all praise be to you because Jesus who ascended intercedes for us now and forevermore. May glory be yours in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson comes to us from Isaiah 42. Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. In a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. The word of the Lord. Be now, brothers and sisters, having considered God's holiness and majesty, as we adored him, we also are reminded of our sins which are ever before our triune God. So let's bow our heads together as we have a time of confession. Let's pray. Father, we come before you knowing we have sinned surely against your holy throne, knowing we have done wrong in thought, word, and deed. And so we ask you to hear our private confessions and then our corporate uh, as they are offered to you in Jesus' name. Now, corporately together, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you 
in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now hear our assurance of pardon, which reminds us that to all who have truly repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Our second scripture text comes from Romans chapter 15, the first 13 verses, and this part of this will be the uh, sermon text this morning. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. Again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, There shall come to the root of Jesse, and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles... In him shall the Gentiles hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, as we do week by week, for the enormous privilege to come into your presence, to seek your face, to have our hearts filled with you. Father, we worship, we adore you. And we thank you for sending your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, not only to save us, but to give meaning to life, that we might have purpose and a sense of significance because you have made us and you have redeemed us and you sustain us all the way through life. Lord, these are great truths. They're vast and immeasurable, just like your love for us. Help us to meditate on the scriptures often that we might have a greater appreciation for the greatness of our God. Father, I would pray this morning that you would shrink into insignificance all those issues and items that seek to crowd our minds while we worship you. Pray, Lord, that your greatness would put everything else in a proper perspective. Pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, every one of us, that you would make us to be the persons 
you would have us to be for your glory and for our sanctification. Father, we pray for our world. We ask that you would bring peace. We pray especially for the war in Gaza and in Ukraine. That, Father, you would bring to an end these conflicts. We think of other places in the world that suffer like Haiti. Lord, I ask that you would give grace and mercy and show your kindness to the citizens of that country. Bring relief as they have suffered for so long, so many years, so many catastrophes. Father, we pray for our church family that you would develop us and grow us. We pray, Lord, that in an age where more and more people identify as non-believers and have given up assembling together, that, Lord, you would use that occasion to demonstrate your mighty power in the gospel and that you would touch hearts and open eyes and bring men and women and boys and girls to yourself. And, Lord, we pray as a local church that we might be involved in that venture. Use us, Lord, for your honor and glory. Multiply our feeble efforts to reach out to the immediate community and beyond. We pray, Lord, that you would bless our Spanish ministries. We pray that you would bless our youth ministries, college and career, young people. Father, we pray that you would show your kindness to our presbytery, that, Lord, more churches might be planted and the gospel would go forward. And, Lord, we do pray earnestly that you would bring some who have never known you, that we might be able to share the gospel with them and see them come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Father, we pray for our officers that you would bless these men, Lord, and use them for your honor and glory. Uh, bless their wives as well, their entire families. We pray that you would put a hedge of protection around them, Lord, and protect them from the evil one. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain us as we walk into the future financially. That, Lord, you would provide for all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, we continue to pray for those who continue to make recovery from surgery and from sickness, and those who continue to deal with physical difficulties. We pray for Marilyn Quick. We pray for Catalina Betancourt. We pray for Kim and Gail Ryer and Becky Yu. We continue to lift up Judy Smith. We pray for Megan Burns and her pregnancy. And we pray for Lenore Ball. Lord, work in these lives. Pour out your spirit upon them. Give them grace and healing. We also remember Nancy Burks and Alice Teachin and Ed Sellers. Lord, continue to help them to recover from surgery. Lord, be with those who are confined and away from us this morning. We pray for Aline Cauley and Pat Barton. We pray for our missionaries, Lord, for Don and Leah Vanderplug and Rodney and Jana Davila, for Dave and Paige Hawes, Aldo Monden, S-I-E-A-T-N. And we pray, Lord, especially for Jimbo and Ann Mullen, that you would be with them this day and their family. Pour out your spirit, Lord, on these saints. Work in their lives. Protect them from the evil one. And now, Lord, as we progress in this worship service, I pray earnestly that you would speak to every heart here, that, Lord, through the workings of your Holy Spirit, the honoring of your word, that you would touch our lives deeply and intimately, that every one of us may leave this place today and say, truly, I have been in the presence of a great and awesome God, indeed, the one true and living God who has made himself known in the person and work 
of his son, Jesus Christ. Lord, work in our lives according to your good, pleasing, and perfect will and your good pleasure. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory for all that you do. As we conclude our prayer today, through that mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray many years ago, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our third scripture lesson comes to us from Matthew chapter 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am, able, that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now let's stand together and sing uh, uh, Hallelujah, my Redeemer. The words are in your bulletin. Let's sing.
Father in heaven, as we come before you, giving to you our tithes and offerings now, we are reminded that you love sacrificial and cheerful givers and ask you to help us to be so uh, and fill our hearts uh, where we lack in this regard uh, up with um, generosity and cheerfulness in our giving. And we do this all uh, for the sake of your kingdom and your glory as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Stand for the doxology. be seated. And as you take your seat, you can open your copy of the Word of God to Romans 15. Romans chapter 15. We had a hiatus of several weeks from our series in Romans in order to observe Holy Week and prior to that, Lent. But now I'd like to return to our series of messages in Paul's letter to the Romans as we look at the last or final two chapters. We're going to look at Romans 15 today, but not the entire chapter, not the entire uh, verses 1 through 13, but simply verses 1 through 3. As I began to look at this passage, I wanted to present the context, uh, but I think there is plenty to digest in verses 1 through 3 before we take the Lord's Supper this morning. 
Paul is wrapping up his teaching on Christian liberty. You remember the last time we were together in the letter uh, to the Romans, he outlined uh, rules and uh, principles for Christian liberty throughout chapter 14. In chapter 14, his emphasis was that believers have a clear conscience concerning food sacrifice to idols. And they should avoid giving offense. In other words, if you are a stronger, more mature Christian, and you know the scriptures well, you're dealing with other people, other believers who may not be like you and are coming out of paganism. And they still have certain beliefs. Even though they may be erroneous, they're still there. And they can be highly offended if you as a conscientious Christian were to eat uh, meat or anything else that had been dedicated to an idol. And so Paul has in verse or chapter 14 been laboring the fact that we need to be sensitive. Those who are mature, those who have grown up in the faith, those who consider themselves strong ought to not give offense to weaker brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And Paul really sums it up in chapter 14, verse 21. He says, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that causes your brother to stumble. Now here in chapter 15, Paul takes his teaching to the next level. He says, in essence, Christians should not only avoid causing fellow believers to stumble, but they should also bear with the weaknesses of their brothers and sisters in Christ and build them up. Build them up. In other words, in addition to having a passive application in chapter 14 by what you don't eat, Paul is saying here now, I want you to be active. I want you to be active in building up your brothers and sisters in Christ and helping those who are weaker around you. I just want to make two points this morning. Number one, I want you to see the responsibility of the strong. Paul outlines that in verses 1 and 2. And then secondly, I want you to notice he gives Christ as our example. And we find that in verse 3. So along with a synopsis of the message, let's join me in prayer and let's ask God to bless our time and study together. Heavenly Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart might bring honor and glory to your name. Father, we wish to see Jesus and him only. And I pray, Lord, that you would move in our midst by your spirit, through your word, that you might touch our lives and that you might do spiritual surgery according to the needs of everyone here. Lord, do all these things and more. We'll give you the praise and glory for what you will do and make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, I want you to notice that Paul says uh, the strong have a responsibility. Verses 1 and 2, the responsibility of the strong. He says, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. There are three significant phrases in these two verses I want you to look at carefully. The first one is, bear with the weaknesses of others. The strong ought to bear with the weakness. Some translations say the failings of others, of the weak. Now, it's only natural. Sometimes strong people are tempted to use their strength to discard or crush the weak. And Paul urges them instead to bear with those who are weak in the body of Christ. And the Greek verb, like the English verb bear, can mean either to endure in the sense of tolerate or to carry with a sense of support. And I believe the latter is the correct usage that Paul intends here. One person's strength can compensate for another person's weakness in the body of Christ. And so we ought never to have that attitude that if we're stronger or more knowledgeable as a believer, that we can simply ignore or even run over other believers who are weaker than us. He goes on in the latter part of verse 1 to say, secondly, not just please ourselves. We who are strong ought not to please ourselves. And you notice Paul puts himself in this category. He's a strong believer. But self-centeredness and self-seeking are natural to 
our fallen human nature. We're living in a culture now that is riddled with obsession with self, self actualization, trying to find out who I truly am, who I really am, and often ignoring the needs of others. I was reading an article the other day, and this a young girl was writing in the question, should I take care of my parents as they get older? And uh, she added to her comments that uh, when growing up, she didn't feel good about herself, and her parents did nothing to help her. And therefore, since they were kind of toxic in the environment she grew up in, she thought she would dismiss herself of giving any type of aid, of taking care of any needs as her parents got older. She made this decision on her own. And that is so typical of the world that we live in right now. So obsessed with self that you begin to push everything else and everyone else out away from you because you don't want to be bothered with them. Paul says, no, we're not going to act like the world. We're not to please ourselves. Christians with a strong conscience must be careful not to trample on the conscience of the weak. And we ought to refrain from using our strength to serve our own advantage. Well, thirdly, he says, not only bear with each other's burdens, or bear with each other's, the weaknesses of each other's, and secondly, not just please ourselves, but thirdly, be pleasing to your neighbor. Look at verse 2. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up neighbor-pleasing, which Scripture commands must not be confused with men-pleasing, which Scripture condemns. Now, ordinarily, to please men, it's usually the antithesis of pleasing God. The Bible is over and over again makes it clear that we are not to be man-pleasers. But first and foremost, we are to fear the living God and then act accordingly in society. Men-pleasing usually means flattering people in order to curry favor with them and win their approval through some unprincipled compromise. It always is incompatible with integrity and sincerity. And so to avoid a possible misunderstanding, Paul qualifies his appeal to please our neighbor with the clause for his good to build him up. For his good to build him up. In other words, they're not just pleasing to gain ground or get an advantage. He's trying to build up his neighbor, and that's the type of pleasing we should do. Instead of causing our neighbor to stumble, to tear him down, or to damage him, we are to build him up. I love the words of John Stott in connection to this. Edification is a constructive alternative to demolition. <laughs> Edification is a constructive alternative to demolition. And unfortunately, sometimes we practice that kind of demolition in the body of Christ. We can get upset with each other, we can get short with each other, and we lose sight that if we think of ourselves as mature and strong, then that will be demonstrated by our willingness to condescend and to help others, to build them up, to educate them and strengthen their conscience. You know, in Paul's day, it would have been very easy to blow people off. Just blow them off and say, I don't have time for this nonsense. I remember a great Bible teacher when I was in seminary. And uh, he actually said one time, I don't care what your fundamentalist grandmother says about this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I won't call this gentleman by name, but I wanted to so badly think about that at the end and say, wait a minute, this is completely contrary to what Paul's teaching. Now, you may be a brilliant scholar. And you may know your original languages and know theology, but if you don't condescend to strengthen those who are weak and to be tender and gentle and love them enough to bring them along, then your maturity isn't really biblical maturity. How do we do all this? How do we bear with each other's weaknesses? How do we not just please ourselves? How do we seek to be pleasing to our neighbor? Well, Jesus explained that our first priority should be to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said that in Mark 
12, verse 30, the great commandment. And when we love Christ above all, all other loves find their proper order and proportion in our lives. When our love for God becomes our highest priority, then that love helps us to love what and whom He loves. For instance, since God loves our neighbor, if we seek to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will indeed love our neighbor. Since God loves us, there is a proper love for self, too. Once again, self-love in the world sense is destructive, if that's our first priority. But when Christ is your first love, then you'll begin to love yourself in a healthy way because Christ loves you. And you'll no longer be obsessed with yourself. There'll be a sense of contentment in your heart that will enable you to love others. Listen to the words of Brian Chapel in connection to this. If Jesus is our first priority, then protecting and promoting the health of the one he loves is a priority that he uses to bring beauty and health to broken lives. I think that's lovely. If we love the Lord God, if we look at Christ and his gospel, we look at his cross, if we rehearse the fact to ourselves that he died on the cross in order to eliminate our sin, in order to eliminate our guilt, in order to take our shame and our disgrace upon himself, the more you think about and contemplate those biblical realities, the more you will be enabled to be set free to love others as God has loved you. And you'll be tender and gentle and kind. Did you notice the words of the servant song in Isaiah 42? He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. The Lord Jesus came. He didn't do any of those things. Yet his life and his message were like dynamite. They were so powerful. A bruised reed he will not break off and a smoldering wick he will not quench. The Lord Jesus was so tender with so many broken lives, lives that seemed like they were on the edge or the brink. He will open eyes that are blind and bring out prisoners from the dungeon, from the prisons of those who sit in darkness. You see, loving God and acknowledging his love for you is what enables you to be and act like a mature Christian with all other believers surrounding you, especially with those who might be weaker than you. You know, we're very cerebral as Presbyterians, and in our circles, often the strong Christian or the mature Christian is the one that knows the most, the one that's read the many books, more books than anyone else. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if you have this and this and this, but you don't have love, profit you nothing. Love is so important. We honor the God who made us when we treat our bodies, our souls, and our consciences with his care. And neglecting or beating up on ourselves never honors the one who made us a temple for his Holy Spirit. You know, there are some Christians that even though they have a legitimate faith in Christ, they look back over their lives and there may have been an incident where they were abused by somebody sexually or beaten. There may be an instance where there is shame and disgrace. But when you look at the Lord Jesus and his tender workings in your life and the fact that when you believe in him, you become a new creature, that's powerful. And that is the message that we have for those around us. But it's also the work that we as Christians and mature Christians have with one another. I know you, I pastor you. Several of you have debilitating diseases, physical diseases that you're suffering from, and you need someone to come along and love you through that. Do you know we have 20 widows in our church? We don't have a big, big membership. Out of 150 people, 20 widows that need care and love and company. When you look at the weaker ones around you, you want to give yourself to serving them. Why? 
because Christ has loved you. And when you focus on his love, you can't help but serve others. And you share Christ's love with even the most broken in the body of Christ to lift them up. Paul said in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. When you focus on Christ's love, your love for him, his love for you, you feel a sense of completion and you want to serve others. You want to help a young person caught in an addictive or self-destructive pattern. Your heart's going to go out to them. You're going to take the time to go have coffee with them, perhaps, or a lunch. When you spend time with someone who has lost a spouse, when you help someone who's been abused to see their value because of God's love for them, and coming to an aid of a fellow believer who has fallen into sin. I got word just the other day of a dear brother in Christ I've known for years now, and apparently there's something wrong. And my heart goes out. I remember 20, 25 years ago, my heart would not have been broken like that. I would just moved on. But as you get older, you begin to realize that when one suffers, we all suffer. And when one is opened up to sin, we all become opened up to sin. That we have to take heed that we stand lest we fall. And we as Christians typically say Jesus loves you when we're trying to reach others. Knowing that when the person values themselves as Jesus does, new life is possible. Well, that's the responsibility of the strong Christian. Now quickly, I want you to notice the example of Christ. Look at verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me. Once again, Paul adds a theological foundation to his appeal. And this time it concerns Jesus Christ himself, who is our example. Why should we please our neighbor and not ourselves? Because Christ did not live to please himself, but to please the Father. Instead of pleasing himself, Jesus gave himself to the service of the Father and to human beings. His approach was to consider others first, consult their interests, and help them in every possible way. You see, Jesus never asserted his rights. As the eternal Son of God, nobody in human history had more of a reason to put forward their rights. But Philippians 2 says, although he was in very nature God, God in flesh, and he had the greatest right of all persons to please himself, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped for his own advantage. But first he emptied himself of his glory and then humbled himself to serve. And you'll notice that passage in our gospel reading this morning when the disciples were fussing over who's going to sit in the big chair <laughs> next to Jesus. That's the way the world operates, isn't it? Me first. The old saying, get all you can, can all you can get, sit on the lid and spit on the rest. That's the way the world operates. And that's the attitude of the apostles in this passage. But Jesus stops them and says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To drink the cup, in other words. And you'll notice Paul quotes from Psalm 69, verse 9. The Psalm 69 vividly describes the unjust, unreasonable sufferings of a righteous man. And the simple statement in verse 9 sums up both the meaning of the incarnation and the character of Christ's earthly life. The passage is quoted of Christ four or five times in the New Testament and is regarded as a messianic prediction. Psalm 69 verse 9 includes the words of Paul's quote, As it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. As an example of his refusing to please himself, Christ so completely identified himself with the name, the will, the cause, and the glory of the Father that insults intended for God the Father fell upon him. Christ not only bore the insults against the Father, 
he also bore our sin on the cross and the Father's wrath against our sins. You see, one of the reasons, the main reason why Jesus, when he came to earth, people hated him and put him to death was because in the heart of man, there is hatred toward God. And that hatred came out against Jesus, God incarnate. And they put him on a cross, and it would have been the end except for the Father's sovereign divine plan. That through the cross and through Christ's crucifixion and later his resurrection, the Lord God Almighty would triumph with the new covenant that would be poured out in our hearts by his Spirit. If you're strong, take note of the weak. But more importantly, take note of Christ. That he loved you and gave himself for you. Not to make you a better you now, but to transform you into a new creature who's obedient to him and loves him and serves him. May we all become servants of Christ and his gospel toward one another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these words and this brief section of this passage. We thank you, Lord, that we have a responsibility, those of us who know the word, those of us who have walked with you for a long time, to help others, to assist them in their growth and development, and not simply overlook them. And Lord, may we always keep the example of Christ in front of us as he suffered unjustly for sinners so that we might have eternal life and experience the grace and the mercy of God and be able to share that love with others who have yet come into the kingdom. Lord, help us to serve one another in the church and then go forth and serve others in our society with the hope that they would come into the kingdom too. Do all these things and more. We'll give you the praise and glory for all that you do in our lives and in our church, and we make our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's begin to sing our hymn of preparation, number 247. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 only as we stand together. be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is good and right so to do. 
It is very good, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Therefore, with the angels and the archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Thy glorious name, evermore praising Thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of Thy glory. Glory be to Thee, O Lord, Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Be seated, please. I want to read the words of institution to you this morning from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 17 through 20. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. The Lord Jesus retained this simple supper of bread and wine for his church for all ages. He never specified how often we should do it, but he said, As often as you do do it. Do it in remembrance of me. Every time we meet and take the Lord's Supper, we're looking back to remember his cross, his death, and his resurrection. And not only that, not only is it terms of remembrance, the Bible also makes it clear that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we take of this supper, it's an act of evangelism, that we believe that Christ is going to come again, and therefore we partake. And then thirdly, it is a means of grace. What do I mean by that? Well, these elements don't uh, miraculously become the actual body and blood of the Lord. No, it is by faith. When you participate and you take the bread and the wine by faith, it's a very real substance of Christ. He's here spiritually. He's not in the elements. And he's made that clear in Corinthians where he said it's a very serious thing to take the Lord's Supper without discerning the body of Christ. It's a serious, serious time of worship. And therefore, if you've never made public profession of faith in Christ, you don't belong to a, a church where the gospel is preached, this supper is not for you. In fact, the Bible is clear it would be harmful to you. But if you've made profession of faith and you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior and you belong to a local church, then this meal is for you. And I invite you to come. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table that you have set forth for over 2,000 years now. As Christians all over the world assemble in order to take the bread and the wine representing the body and blood of Jesus. Father, I pray now that you would take these ordinary elements and set them aside to extraordinary use as we partake by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nourish us, Lord, to that end now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Now our deacons will uh, come up and dismiss you row by row, and you'll come up and grab the elements and return to your seats until we all partake together. I'd also like to remind you that the outer ring, of, uh, uh, the outer ring is uh, wine and the inner cups are grape juice, so follow your conscience on that.
body and blood of Christ. Body and blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, take and eat. The blood of Christ, drink ye all of it. Father in heaven, you, has, you have given us a Lord Jesus Christ, who has shed his blood on the cross for our sins. We thank you for such a sweet and precious Savior. We know that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And as we have partaken of this supper, which reminds us of those precious gospel truths and helps us to look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb, where Christ himself will gird us, and serve us as sweet manna all around. Uh, we pray that you would nourish us, mature us, sanctify us, and use this supper to feed your people exactly in the way that you have intended. And all praise be to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's uh, stand together once more and uh, sing the last verse of our hymn, 247. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.